Okie dokie. Hello, everybody. As it's uh, 12 o'clock, we're ready to go live. So thank you for signing up. Uh, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes to wait and see if a few more people make their way into the room. Uh, but then we'll be uh, going live in a couple of minutes. Hope everyone's doing well. Had, had nice weekends and ready for the ready for the end of the year. There we go. We're getting a few more people in now. So Trust everyone's been to the toilet before the webinar, but if uh, if you uh, want to make sure that you're undisturbed, now would be the time. We've got a couple of minutes. Okay, so there's a good number of people in. I think if anyone's going to be uh, slightly late, then they can uh, catch up as and when. But uh, yeah, thanks very much for uh, joining the webinar, everyone. Uh, uh, I hope everyone's doing well and uh, yeah, ready for a restful Christmas break uh, come the end of end of next week. Uh, I thought it would be nice for us to do one more webinar before the Christmas break. And uh, it's uh, one that I wanted to do for a little while, which is with um, with Cambo, who are a close partner of ours and a company which I'm a, a big fan of. And, and we generally at Teamwork, uh, you know, stand behind quite firmly. They uh, make fantastic camera systems, uh, fantastic studio and video accessories. And uh, yeah, we're uh, we're going to be honoured to join, uh, be joined by Richard Locke who's their uh, part of their sales team and uh, yeah covering all things Cambo specifically their camera systems so their view and technical cameras which can be used across a range of uh, various different digital camera platforms uh, so it's a very exciting product um, for those who I don't know uh, or don't know me uh, my name is Al Simmons and I work in the sales team at Teamwork Digital in the chat section uh, you've got my colleague and director Steve Martin who's going to be moderating the chat and uh, answering all of your questions that come through in there and also flagging any questions that can be passed on to Richard uh, to answer at the end if they're slightly more specific uh, so yeah if you've got any questions head over to the chat <coughs> section and you can uh, you can put your uh, put any questions in there and, and, and Steve will be handling those and then also if you scroll across there are a couple of polls that I've listed in there just so that we can gauge, uh, you know, where people are coming from, what type of photography background they've got. And uh, again, what might be interesting for us to, uh, to cover. So head on to the poll section if you've, uh, if you've got a couple of minutes and, and fill in that. Uh, yeah, but without further ado, I think the nicest place to start is a little bit of an introduction about uh, teamwork ourselves for those of you who don't know uh, we're a company based down in London and uh, we're a close partner of Cambo amongst uh, amongst other brands um, I've got a slide somewhere which covers our company outline so we yeah we represent a, a fairly large scope of, uh, of photography companies uh, both uh, both professional and non-professional uh, and also both kind of in studio and out of the studio um, we're uh, yeah a, a digital medium format supplier amongst other uh, studio lighting and bits and pieces as well so um, for those of you who don't know uh, that's uh, that's teamwork as a company and today we are going to be focusing on the cambo side of things and i thought the best place to start there would be uh, where Cambo are now and and uh, what sort of uh, company Cambo are uh, today uh, in 2020. So I'm going to share this uh, video 
which was produced by them uh, earlier this year, which gives a outline of Cambo as a company. Oh, try that again. <coughs> There is no sound on the video, so you don't need to troubleshoot your speakers. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, I think from, from my point of view, uh, Cambo, uh, generally speaking, are a, uh, a camera manufacturer, but then also they do have a long history when it comes to uh, studio and, uh, and video products as well. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Richard Lott into the room, who is from Cambo themselves, and he'll be there to spread the gospel on all things Cambo. Hey, hello, Alan. And there we yeah. go. I've joined the room. Hello, Richard. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for joining. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. So... Uh, as, as I said in the intro, it's something that we've been wanting to do for a long time. Uh, you know, we're uh, we're big fans of Cambo here at Teamwork, and uh, it's uh, uh, quite a uh, interesting uh, company. And, uh, and 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 you know, the kind of products that you develop. Uh, in the market is, uh, you know, you definitely have a, a kind of niche place. So it'd be nice to have a bit more background to what you do and the kind of products that you um, that you do. So, I mean, maybe a nice place to start would be a kind of brief introduction of yourself and your role at Cambo, and then also whatever you can uh, offer as insight into the history of Cambo and and who the company are and and where you've come from. Uh, right. Yeah. My role at Cambo. I'm well, normally uh, I would be a little bit less in the office and a little bit more out uh, traveling, but um, well, as we all know, this is not, has not been a normal year. So when you call Combo or when you send an email to Combo, there's a fair chance that I will answer the phone or, or reply to your email. Um, I do take care of uh, sales and service. That, that's one of my roles within the company. And um, yeah, Combo is, is not a big company, so uh, most people here, most colleagues, we are all wearing different uh, different hats uh, depending on uh, what the workflow requires. And I think it's uh, for a good reason that you, you, you started with this footage uh, showing some of our manufacturing uh, process. Uh, yeah. I think nowadays Combo is one of the few few camera and technical camera manufacturers still still machining their own parts and assembling their own products. So we, uh, uh, yeah, it's fair to say that we take great pride in our, our own machining capacity. And um, it's good to see that other, other companies value our machining because we are also mm. a partner, an OEM partner to uh, some reputable brands. It's not, it's not just Cambo products that we are manufacturing here. We, well, you have already seen in the video, we also uh, we manufactured the Phase 1 XT camera. It's uh, the machines we'll are... we touching on a little later on. Yeah, yeah the machines are, uh, are, or the parts are machined here. Uh, the camera itself is, is assemb assembled here. And that is something that we also do for some other brands. But obviously, our own cameras, our, the Cambo cameras and other Cambo products, that is still, um, yeah, that's still the core business here at, uh, at Cambo. And have Cambo always been a camera manufacturer, going back to the formation of the company? Yeah, it actually has been, yeah. Um, Cambo was founded in, uh, in uh, 1946, so uh, next year will be our 75th uh, anniversary, and I hope it will be a better year to celebrate an anniversary than it is now. Um, mm -hmm. But from the very beginning, Cambo has, uh, has been a manufacturing, manufacturer of uh, few cameras and studio stands. I mean, studio stands is also 
have always been a very important product for Cambo. This, I've even heard uh, some of your colleagues say that uh, uh, Cambo is almost it's a synonym for a, su a studio stand. Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of people who maybe aren't familiar with Cambo as a, a camera manufacturer will definitely know the stands from uh, you know from professional studios because they're yeah as you say they're quite synonymous. Yeah, and, uh, I think many people have seen uh, our stands when they when they visit the Focus Studio, but aren't aware that this is made by Cambo because. Usually on a studio stand, the brand is not very visible. I mean, it's just a big back black column on a cast iron foot. At least that is what it looks like on the outside, and um, it's not it's not screaming out loud to Cambo. So it's it's a very important product, what, what, product for us. I think what's what's fair to say is they do scream out heavy duty and quality, though. So maybe it bodes quite well. Uh, you know, a manufacturer making stands like that, producing cameras. You know, they're very, uh, you know, precision instruments. Yeah, yeah. I know that a lot of stands outlive a photographer's career and they're passed on to, to their, uh, yeah, to their children. Uh, mm. uh, there's one particular stand in our uh, lineup, which is the Cambo UST, which has been manufactured for over 50 years now. And we are still supplying, every week we are supplying parts for these kind of stands. Because people are still working with, with 40 or 50 years old, old stands. And well, there's a couple of mm. parts that you have to replace after a couple of decades, like, like the brakes. At some point, uh, it will come down on its own. So you have to replace the brake parts, which is a, a, mm. a low cost item. But that is how we notice that there are so many of these stands around the world and still in daily use after, after mm. many decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when it comes to the camera side of things, so um, uh, for many, many years, uh, Cambo would have been making, you know, what what we know as large format cameras, so five by four and and ten by eight studio view cameras. Um, and I guess one of the things that I'm quite interested to look into is the point at which that kind of transitioned into, I suppose, what we now know as uh, as medium format. So when when Cambo changed their uh, direction slightly from solely making view cameras to uh, making what kind of we now know as uh, as technical cameras loosely. So I've got a, I don't know the year that this camera was produced that I'm I'm showing there, but uh, uh, I believe that was one yeah. of the uh, <laughs> that was yeah. one of the early yeah. uh, kind of uh, you know um, uh, technical cameras or plate cameras uh, or, or, or however they're referred to. But you know what was the what was the kind of um, the journey like for Cambo in terms of the evolution of their their systems from view camera to technical camera. Well, actually, also I I also uh, prepared a bit. So this is this is actually the the one that came after the model that you are showing, but it's still quite mm -hmm. substantial if you compare it to to the one that we make nowadays. This is the WRS, mm -hmm. which can be used with a digital back. And there's obviously a good reason that these camera cameras are a little bit more substantial because they they had to be used with four, uh, five four inch. Uh, film as well, so they needed to be larger. And um, yeah, you say the transition, um, it's not that we abandon few cameras for technical cameras. I mean, we have always, or Combo started as a manufacturer of few cameras, and about 50 years ago, we introduced the, the few, the, the first um, technical camera or pancake camera, as somebody, some people prefer to, to call it. Uh, at that time, the Main reason to do that was that bellows type view cameras were not really suitable to use with wide angle lenses. If you wanted to use, let's say, a 58 millimeter lens or a, even a 47, which was very, very wide at the time for a 5-4 inch uh, film, it was almost impossible to focus such a, len le such a lens on a view camera because you had a very uh, dim ground glass image and yeah, the, the, the amount of travel of the bellows was, the, the, sh the shorter the focal length, the smaller the amount of travel in the, focal, in the, in the bellows you, you need. So it was very hard to focus a lens like this. So it was actually for architectural photographers, it was a blessing that there were other cameras that uh, allowed them, enabled them to make high quality work shooting on large format film without the need of a bellows type camera. And that was actually the reason to introduce tech cams or pancake cameras on which the, um, the focusing is not done with a bellows but with a helical focusing mount like you know from 
Mm. Well, every audio ca camera like your, your DSLR. Mm. And so you say that for a long time that was um, th these pancake cameras were for use with uh, with five by four film. Mm -hmm. And I think we can see on that picture it's got the it's got the holder for film on there. But how quickly were uh, did Cambo adapt to uh, digital back technology when that came about as well? I think very uh, yeah. Cambo was one of the early adapters in that field. Um, mm. If you take it on this camera. Um, this is actually the bridge between analog and digital. This camera was uh, at first introduced for analog photography, uh, but when in the late 90s, early zeros, when uh, digital photography became more common amongst prof professional photographers, and at that time digital photography in high quality was, uh, was photography using a digital bag. I mean, DSLRs at that time were non-existent. Or the quality was simply too low, um, yeah, for, for for pros. So that camera was at first it was adapted for use with digital bags, like uh, at that time Phase One and Mamiya Leaf were pioneers. And a little bit later, Hasselblad came along, and uh, our cameras have always been open platforms that could be used with all kinds of digital bags. And then. Um, very soon after the first WRS was introduced, which is, well, this is not the first one, it's actually the current model, the WRS 1600. This camera was, was mainly developed for use with digital bags. So it was more refined because the more pixels the bags cut, the more critical uh, the whole focusing and um, yeah, the, the parallelity of the camera and everything became so the, it, at some point, it was not for critical work. Uh, photographers could no longer work with their old four or five cameras that they simply converted to digital. They needed dedicated cameras for digital photography. And mm. that, that's how we gradually changed our whole, yeah, whole, our complete lineup of cameras. Mm. And I suppose the development, well, the, the changes in the way that you were designing focusing systems made working mm. with you know, uh, older legacy generation backs where you didn't have the uh, the uh, the benefit of live preview. You know, you were able still to uh, achieve focus using, uh, I suppose, some sort of distance meter. But you did have a, you know, an optical finder that you could make use of. Whereas with uh, uh, a view camera, uh, you know, without that ability to to live preview, uh, you were quite restricted, I suppose, on on composition and 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 you know framing uh, images. So. Um, I suppose the technical cameras there were the bridge between uh, between film and digital technology. Yeah, in the early days, um, if you, for instance, look back at, uh, let's say, a Leaf for Lara, which was a, a camera that, or a digital bag that was in those days was quite popular in uh, high-end photo studios. It had some kind of primitive live view, in black and white. So in the studio environment, uh, you, you could work with that. Uh, mm -hmm. This was a kind of uh, digital bag that was mainly used on um, on few cameras, but when you go to the to the pancake cameras, many photographers they they could do without live view. They just used a simple viewfinder to to make their composition. Mm -hmm. There was a possibility to add a ground glass if you want to do critical focusing, but very often focusing was just set on the helical was actually estimated, and then one one uh, the first exposure was made. Just to control the settings, just to see if, if you're right, if you're spot on, and, and then go from there. Yeah, that. I mean, I've, I've, I've even I've even spoken to some people who, uh, you know, admittedly with the uh, the slightly more compact modern uh, WRS cameras are able to, you know, work with an optical viewfinder handheld, uh, you know, even without using live view. Um, you know, so it's. Uh, um, you know, it is it's, it's, it's possible to uh, once you know the system to to make it work in in a variety of situations. Um, but maybe um, an outline of you know what I kind of loosely term as manual photography. You know, for those people who maybe don't know, you know, what is the kind of operation like of a technical camera? You know, because it's very much a analog system, though you might be using it with a digital back. Uh, right, I, I take this one here. If you're not familiar with it, it may, may look a little bit weird, uh, but on any technical camera, uh, you, need to, you need to synchronize the digital back that's behind it with the, with the shutter that's built into the, in the lens. 
uh, we see here, we see a Hasselblad lens on it. It's not very often we, uh, we use lenses like this, which is the rotor stock with a cobalt shutter. No, no matter which shutter you are using, you have to synchronize it to the back. So the digital backs gives a signal, or the, actually the, the, the flash contact on your shutter gives a signal to the digital back. So shutter is cocked. This is how we operate it. And um, for many photographers who are a little bit, uh, who are familiar to their, to their gear, they can't work without a viewing aid. They can simply estimate the distance on the, on the helical, set it, make it, make an exposure, control it, and, and they're done. I mean, and maybe they say, okay, uh, I want a little bit more foreground or I want a little bit more, more sky, and they change, they change their amount of horizon fall. And, uh, you can all control it on the, on the rear of the camera. But obviously, CMOS bags that uh, came along, well, this the Credo 50 was probably the first one, or the IQ uh, 150. It's like eight or nine years ago, I guess. Uh, that made it all a lot easier. So uh, we see this, but we have no demand for viewing aids whatsoever anymore. Yeah. Uh, like five, six years ago. Everyone's using like yeah. Mm. A couple of years ago, people still asked for viewfinders, or they wanted to have an, uh, a ground class with their new with their new tech cam. But there's that there's hardly any demand for it anymore. Mm. So that's kind of really uh, taken. I mean, because anyone who's not worked with a technical camera before, you know, the process is very uh, considered. You know, even if you are working uh, with the uh, with 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 technology like live preview, you know, it's a very slow way of working uh, where you have absolute control over it. Um, so I suppose it's been a real uh, a real development for for Cambo technical cameras to have uh, the ability of live preview to replace you know, ground glass focusing and, and what have you, because it really does allow you to work a lot, uh, a lot more precisely. Oh, definitely. And it, it made, it made it a lot easier for a lot of people and uh, more controllable. And I think it's also uh, probably without, without CMOS, we would have never seen a camera like the Phase 1 XT because CMOS was obviously the first step to make, uh, to make a, a technical camera user, more user friendly. Uh, mm. The next big, big step was the X shutter that uh, that Phase One introduced uh, last year, and um, that made it possible to to develop a camera like the Phase One XT, which is mm -hmm. basically shaped around the X shutter. Mm. It's a it's a digi you know even though it's got the appearance of of the the types of technical cameras that we're talking about, it is a you know for all intents and purposes a digital camera, which is quite interesting. So I think when we when we look at you know how the future might look for uh, for, for, for this type of camera manufacturing, you know, it's quite interesting that it's become a, a digital platform now, as opposed to one where you need sync cables and to mechanically cock shutters mm. and, and what have you. Um, so yeah, we'll touch on that at the end. And so I suppose alongside the, um, so the WRS cameras, which again, so they kind of developed into these, uh, these systems, which we've got here, which are, you know, very much uh, still currently available. The uh, Cambo then developed the Actus, which uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of. Uh, and it would be great to hear, uh, you know, how, the, I mean, obviously it's got its, if we look at that image in the middle, which is what we, uh, we know as the, Cam, uh, the Actus XL, you know, that's very much got its roots in the, in the view cameras that you were making for 5x4 and 10x8. But what was the, what was the, the theory behind the Actus and what it could become? And, uh, you know, when, when, when you decided to release this, uh, I think it was about five years ago the Actus was released? Or? Yeah, it was for the Kina 2014. So, yeah. yeah. yeah what, what, what triggered it was actually was the introduction of the uh, Sony A7, that's fair to say. Because the Sony A7, it was the first mirrorless camera with a, what we now call a, a, a full-frame sensor. So that was actually, that was... Uh, that was showing that manufacturers were going to, to take mirrorless seriously. It was no longer uh, just a camera for amateurs and serious photographers uh, would be buying DSLRs forever. You could see that uh, we were slowly, gradually moving towards mirrorless. And one of the, one of the big advantages of a mirrorless system is that you have a, a much wider range of, of lenses that you can use because the flange focal distance of the camera 
is so much shorter compared to a DSLR. Mm. So uh, come 2014, uh, we introduced um, yeah, we introduced the Actus and presented it on uh, on Fotokina that that year, and we could actually immediately immediately see that about half of these cameras were bought by by Sony users. Well, in those days, Sony wasn't even a big camera brand. I mean, they have mm -hmm. now they have become one of one of the big brands. Uh, uh, they are on, on par with uh, with Nik Nik Nikon and Canon, but at, at that time, Sony was actually just starting out. They had just uh, acquired Minolta, so it, it was mm. so that was already showing that mirrorless was going to be really, really big. Uh, for Camo, uh, by the way. Uh, this type of photography wasn't really new because uh, you showed uh, the Actus XL. The predecessor of the Actus XL was the Combo Ultima. So that was also a, yep. a few camera that was developed for use by with 5.4, but also for digital. Uh, and also already this this Combo Ultima it had had a version for use with Nikon and Canon DSLRs, and it okay. gradually became more popular when the quality of DSLR, digital DSLRs uh, became better and not all photographers had the need or the budget to go for a digital bag. I mean, there's a lot of photo studios where they do catalog work, which has to look decent enough, but it does not, doesn't need to be printed uh, yeah, the size of a billboard. And even when, when DSLRs were just six megapixels, they could do yeah, and the bulk of their work with cameras like that. Mm. So this mm -hmm. this digital application for Nikon and Canon, it gradually became more and more important and, and more popular amongst our customers. Mm. And you, you mentioned the limitations uh, with lenses when using a camera that, you know, uh, pre-mirrorless technology. And in, in the top right-hand corner uh, of this picture here, we've got a... A Nikon digital SLR on the back of an Actus. What kind of limitations would that have with lenses compared to a mirrorless camera where you do have that shorter flange distance? Yeah, if you take the, that particular camera, the Nikon DSLR, it has a flange focal distance of 46 and a half millimeter. It's actually the, the largest flange focal distance amongst DSLRs. Uh, in general, that means that you can't use any large format lenses or enlarger lenses uh, that are shorter than 80 millimeter. I mean, there are workarounds. If you want to use a shorter focal length, you can, can use a, a retrofocus type of lens. Uh, you may adapt, uh, uh, yeah, let's say, a Hasselblad lens to it. That's the way you can work around it. But it's not suitable for, uh, for many, yeah, for, for really short focal lengths. If you compare this to- So it would be- to, yeah, be good for close-up macro work, but not necessarily no, for you wide angle. Yeah, at, at some point, uh, front and rear stand would be so close together, you can't get any further, and you can't focus to infinity anymore. And if you compare this to uh, to the current Nikon uh, mirrorless camera, uh, which is actually the camera with the, uh, the mirrorless camera with the shortest flange focal distance, only 16 millimeter. So there's there's a good 30 millimeter that you can use for your lenses. Or, for, or actually for the mechanism and the bellows that you want to put behind the lens and the camera body. So that uh, that okay. opens all kinds of possibilities. Hmm. And alongside the Actus, you do make your own uh, specific lenses uh, that are Cambo lenses uh, to go alongside that. Was that always the case with the Actus or was, because it's a very, you know, you've used the term open platform already and the Actus is, you know, really as open platform as you could like, you know, you can get adapters for all sorts of lenses, but was it always the idea that uh, it would be, uh, you know, did you release these lenses to be used with the Actus from the beginning or have they come, come further down the line? And also, I suppose also what flexibility is there with other lens manufacturers uh, with the Actus? Yeah, it's, it's fair to say that this came further down the line. At the beginning, we, we did not have our own line of lenses. Uh, when we started with the Actus, uh, Schneider was still uh, was still manufacturing uh, large format lenses, just to, to use this term terminology. Um, they, they quit the business a couple of years ago. They don't have their own line of lenses anymore. 
So at that time, we could offer um, we could offer the act actors with Schneider and Rolenstock lenses. Schneider even had a, mm -hmm. uh, a 28 millimeter wide angle lens that was suitable for use with uh, with DSLRs. So that was a nice option for for interior and architectural photographers. But at some point, um, there was a huge demand for wider lenses because we were used to, to photographers working in a studio environment and buying our Ultima or later the, it, we have not mentioned that yet, but between the Ultima and the Actus, there was also the Combo X2 Pro, which was a dis dedicated system for use with DSLR cameras. So we were used to those photog photographers using those cameras and shooting products in the studio and working with lenses like uh, an 80 or a 90 mil, which also uh, yeah, worked fine with these cameras. Uh, but now we had to cater for other demands because the Actus is a lot smaller actually than, than the cameras that we used to manufacture. And it's a good uh, 1.2 kilogram, something like that. So uh, it's very easy to carry it around and to take it outdoors. So suddenly uh, we became more and more demand from architectural and interior photographers for our products. And they were also attracted by the, the possibilities of mirrorless cameras. And partly we could cover that demand by, by offering adapters like, like this one, which is for Pentax 645, 645. So you can, uh, for instance, you can use the 35 millimeter lens from the Pentax system on your combo actors put your camera behind it and you're basically using your camera as a digital back and you're using the 35 millimeter from the Pentax system uh, as a large format lens within which image circle you can shift the sensor. So you, you can do a lot with that. But then again, uh, you have to rely on lenses that were on the, yeah, that are pre-owned, that are on the second hand market. Mm -hmm. And you also want to have, sure. want to offer something new and something, uh, something wider. So then the first Actus lens that we introduced was the 24, which became very popular. And then soon it was soon followed by a, by a, yeah, a series of, of small lenses, uh, 60, 80, 90, and 120 mil that became more popular amongst the studio photographers and 120, for instance, for, for macro work. And then most, most recent addition is this one. This is the, this is the Acta 90. Uh, it's not a secret that this is basically is a Nikon lens. It's the Nikon PC 19 millimeter lens that we did uh, well quite a bit of rework on it to make it suitable for the actors. And the reason that we choose this lens that it is first of all it's it's great quality. Uh, it has a very large image circle. A little bit more about it later. And um, yeah, it it does need some rework. We, we changed this lens aperture. So we actually, we took, we took the Nikon lens apart. Uh, we, the normal, every Nikon lens has an electronic, electronically controlled aperture. The aperture, aperture is controlled from the camera body. So we replaced it with a mechanical aperture, which required obviously a new barrel. We needed a we need machine, we needed to rehouse the lens. And then at the rear, we removed the mechanism, the tilt swing mechanism that is normally in this Nikon lens. By doing so, you make it shorter here and you can make better use of the, the lens image circle. And the good thing about this lens is that um, it, it does even cover a phase one sensor. Uh, it, it, it covers the large medium format sensor, so the, the, the 40, 40 to 53.2 millimeter sensor that's in a phase one camera. And it's it's sharp from edge to edge, so it is. We we were we were quite impressed with this lens when we first made our when we made our first prototype. We tested it on a phase one camera, and found out that it was actually better than we expected because our goal was to make a good uh, wide angle lens that people could use with their uh, with their mirrorless camera with their their twenty four to thirty six millimeter sensor. But it's it's far better. It, it, uh, it's, it's a perfect lens to use on a, a Fuji, Fuji DFX 100. So uh, mm -hmm. that's also a quite demanding camera, which has small pixels. The smaller the pixels, the more demanding it's on the lens. 
Uh, it's it's really sharp from corner to corner, and with the Fuji you have about eight or nine mil of shift rise and fall that you can apply, which is pretty good for such a wide angle lens and such yeah that kind of sensor. Mm. So yeah, so we've got the GFX on the back of an Actus in the bottom right hand corner there, uh, and that's got a an RZ67 lens on the front, which you you make an adapter. That's what all yeah. Um, yeah, and um, I suppose it'd be interesting to hear from you. You know, if you because it's it's a question we get a lot uh, from people who are interested in the Actus. Uh, you know, because it's quite a journey to go about. Uh, you know, selecting lenses. You know, depending on the application and 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 also what cameras on the back of there. Um, but it'd be good to hear from you, kind of what um, what people should be aware of when they're selecting lenses you know if if they are you know either using a mirrorless camera or, or or medium format as we as we know it today you know what what should people be aware of in terms of selecting lenses because you cater for so many different types yeah there's so many different type different types but it's very hard to give a general advice i mean uh, you first need to ask uh, what what are you primarily shooting what what do you need what are your requirements and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, a tabletop photographer has other photo uh, other requirements than somebody who's going uh, who's shooting landscape or somebody shooting interiors, and uh, it's very hard to give a general mm -hmm. advice. It, it's fair to say that not every lens that was great on film is also great on a modern digital camera. Um, it's even hard to give a general advice on a particular type of lens because we see that there's a lot of variety amongst copies because um, okay. in, the, uh, in the days those lenses were manufactured film was less critical than digital sensor so they could get away with some yeah some variety in quality i mean that that wasn't wasn't noticeable on film and it is noticeable on uh, if you have one of the latest sensors hmm. but um it's in terms of the image circle you know so um if someone was using a um, a medium format sensor, let's say from the GFX uh, or what have you, you've mentioned that that the newer Nikon or Actar 19 millimeter lens has a nice large image circle which you can work around. Um, would there be limitations, say, with something like the Canon uh, adapter which you make, if people were wanting to use uh, the wide angle Canon adapters? You know, is 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 the image circle the primary consideration uh, if you're wanting flexibility? Uh, well, it's definitely important. Um, I mean, the, the primary primary reason that we manufacture a Canon adapter is to enable the use of uh, Canon's tilt, tilt and shift lenses, because that, that are actually the only Canon lenses that have a large enough image circle to be of, of serious use. I mean, theoretically, you could adapt any Canon EF lens on that adapter. And some very large lenses may even work because, in general, uh, larger focal lengths tend to have a little bit larger image circle than, than wide-angle lenses. Mm -hmm. But most most lenses won't be very suitable. It, it, it won't bring you anything extra when you're adapting them because you can fo you can focus, but you can't shift, or you can hardly shift. Okay. So, and that is obviously uh, one of the reasons that you want to use a, a camera system like that. You want to have control of your plane of focus you want to, to uh, tilt and swing the lens if necessary and you want to shift it so you need something that has a, a larger image circle than than just covering your sensor mm. so the actar 19 is quite a big development then in that it gives you a super wide angle lens which has and and you know generally speaking quite an affordable uh affordable lens uh for that kind of purpose that does give you at a you know, a, an ample amount of shift possibility. Yeah, it's uh, it's like 12 millimeter on a, on a mm. 24 26 uh, sensor, so that's pretty good. I mm. mean, that's in general more than you will need with a 90 millimeter lens. Mm. Yeah, nice. And what I mean, as a I suppose as a as a rough gauge, because technical cameras are very popular for architectural photographers because of the control they give you over perspective, you know, technical and view cameras uh, in terms of keeping, uh, keeping lines nice and straight when you are shifting images. Um, do you find there are, 
a lot of people in your experience who are still using Cambo systems in the studio as well, where they would have traditionally used view cameras, you know, with, even with the development of digital technology that they're still wanting to make use of those principles in the studio. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm. Yeah, uh, and especially the, the larger cameras that we built, maybe not so much the actors, the, well, the smaller actors, but the, the, mm. the larger one that you, uh, you, that you showed in one of your slides, the one that's in the middle, that, that yeah. one that lives in the studio. I mean, there, there's not many people taking it outdoors. And it does make sense to use a camera like this, not only to, to keep your line straight, which is in, can be important, because you don't want to correct everything in post, but it's also important to have control over your plane of focus. And in some application, that may be because you need to have focus from front to the rear, but it can also be for, for creative applications like we see very often in, uh, let's say, food photography, where there's just a sh very shallow plane of focus, uh, but it's very controlled. And that's something that you can only obtain when you're using view camera. Mm. And I mean, I certainly have my opinion on the value in preserving these traditional principles with digital photography. But from your point of view and from uh, from Cambo's point of view, you know, how how important do you see it as to, you know, maintain production of view camera systems, even as we are having more technological advances with digital um, and maybe how, how, you know, how those can go hand in hand together? you know into the future I, I don't see i don't see technical advances as, as a threat i think it's uh, mm -hmm. it has has brought us a lot i mean uh, we, we wouldn't have been able to to develop a camera like this without without recent technical technological advances advantages and um, mm -hmm. there are still many things uh, in photography that you cannot achieve in post that you need to you need to get it right uh, when you're shooting Focus stacking is, is great, and uh, for some applications you do need focus stacking, even when you're working with a view camera. But it's not it's not the same as having perfect control of your plane of focus. I mean, when you're stacking your focus, you will have focus from front to the to the far point, but you will also have your background in focus. Whilst when you have, when you're working with a view camera, you can have only your your object in focus. And still keep your mm. own, keep your background out of focus, which which does make a difference. Mm. And then also, I mean, because I mean, anyone who uh, anyone who hasn't uh, seen or used an Actus, uh, you know, I would encourage to do so because I think that one of the one of the things I love about it is it's a very tactile system. You know, you're in control of everything. And you know, as someone who didn't grow up in an age of of, of large format view cameras. I love the fact that you can use a, you know, a Sony or a, a Fuji or a, or a digital back on the back of a camera where you have full control over it. And I think, you know, there's, I think there's something to be said for that, you know, having as much control over the camera as possible, uh, you know, from an experience point of view as well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, maybe uh, you've got some insight in that in terms of feedback that you get from customers over, you know, the experience of shooting with a Cambo. Yeah, well, there's there's a group of of, uh, of users, photographers, who are enthusiasts, who, um, who have never thought about uh, adding a, a large format camera or a big view camera to their inventory. They've never worked with that, and they yeah, they see it, they see some somebody use it, and uh, most of the time these people are a little bit more interested in in photographic techniques. And they just want to explore it, and they start to like it, and, and they work with it. And they, what I hear very often is that they actually they appreciate and, and like the experience of slow photography, of being in control and taking that time to, to compose an image, to, to experiment a little bit with uh, where, where to have the plane of focus, to change, it, to change this, and then to decide how to make the image, actually to create the image. Then there's obviously the other group of users, which are the pros, who are very well, well, from education or experience, are very well aware what a, what a few camera can do for them. They simply need it, and they want something well made, and they want uh, they want it to be uh, easy to use or uh, well, robust, reliable, mm -hmm. and they want good service. So they want to, to to deal with a company that is easy to access, uh, where they are supported when 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 something is going wrong. 
Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I can definitely, uh, I can definitely um, put myself in the category of the first where I think, you know, I think experience of using a camera is quite important. Uh, and, and, you know, with the, with the actors, you've got no, it's fully mechanical. So you're not, you're not having to go into a menu or change a setting to, uh, you know, to get something right. It's, it's all in, all in your control. Uh, and I like that. Um, so taking us now to, I'd say, well, what you've said to me in the past as being a fairly big development for Cambo, even though it's not a Cambo camera would be the, so the phase one XT, which was introduced uh 18 months ago or so just over a year ago uh, i think september and last year september yeah. last year okay time time's running away from me but um how does what does what does the fate even though it's a phase one camera how how does that sit within within kind of cambo's portfolio now and how significant is it to, to cambo as a company well, a couple of years ago it became uh, it became clear to everyone in the, in the industry that we were running out of cold pulse shutters. And if you want to work with a digital bag uh, and a, a view camera or a technical camera, you always needed a lens with a cold pulse shutter, which you could synchronize to the digital bag, which, yeah, what, what we talked about it, uh, in, in the beginning. We now, there is an alternative now, uh, since the, the latest phase one bags or uh, phase one bags starting in the IQ3 have uh, ES, the so-called rolling shutter, but its use is still yeah, fairly limited. I mean, it's mostly it's for landscape aesthetic objects. You, you cannot shoot everything with a, with a rolling shutter. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was actually a, a, a dark cloud over the industry, you could say. So we were quite happy to hear that phase one was, was developing their own shutter, the X shutter. And at some point they approached us and they were inspired by, I can say by this camera, that we had been manufacturing manufacturing for a couple of years, and they wanted to have something similar, branded Phase One, uh, but smaller, more uh, yeah, easier to carry around, and with integrated electronics. And actually, this shutter, uh, the X shutter, made it made it possible to integrate electronics into the camera body. So the Phase One XT is actually the first tech cam that. Um, communicates through the shutter to the back uh, the amount of rise and fall that you have applied the amount of shift and it is that may may look trivial but it's also the, the first tech cam which has a shutter button which makes it easier to to use it handheld held if you want to so um you you may not only consider it a, a technical camera it's also just it's it's, it's also a, it's, a mirrorless camera uh, using sure. large, yeah, the largest sensor around. It, hmm. And um, it it uh, so where you were kind of describing the process before of having a you know a cable to the digital back. Now you can you can work with a you know from from the lens all the way to the digital back. It's a uh, a digital camera, which is a, a fairly huge development. Um, and does that? I mean, that must bode quite well for. Um, you know with the availability now of the x shutter that seems to me like it's going to be quite significant to the um the the the, the future of, of of view cameras and technical cameras going forward because we've now got a you know a modern shutter type yeah um like uh and last week we took delivery delivery of the the first uh, x shutter lenses that were for other cameras than the phase one xt phase one that has made uh, the x shutter available uh for new for new run stop lenses and for rebuilds which means that uh, photographers will need to replace their global shutter or want to some yeah want to move to a new platform they they are able to send in their large format lenses to us and then we will take care of re replacement of the shutter uh, that's a, that's for a selection of schneider schneider lenses and uh, all run stop digital lenses mm. Um, I, have no, I don't have one on the table here, but if you attach one of those lenses to a Cambo camera, there still is the need to use a cable like this that connects the mm -hmm. particular shutter with the digital back because there's no integration through the camera body, but that will be the only cable that you need. And it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more, it's more user friendly than a cobalt shutter because you don't need to cut the shutter. You, you have. Uh, mm -hmm open aperture when focusing, you can simply uh, 
simply stop down, uh, set, set the shutter, shutter time on your digital bag and expose. And it's, it's very easy to work with. Having said that, it is, it is limited, it's a phase one shutter, so it's limited to use with a phase one IQ4, IQ4 digital bag. So yeah, it is yeah. for, um, for uh, yeah, a fairly limited uh, amount of photographers. But that's one of the reasons that a camera yeah. like this is also very important to us. Yeah, so it's um, the, 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 the engine, as it were, is the, uh, is the phase one digital back, um, which, um, which, yeah, does make it a, um, yeah, it, it, it limits it that from that perspective. Um, I suppose what would be interesting is, or what I find interesting with going back to the actors for a second, is the image that's in the middle and on the right-hand side, which shows the actors G, where you've got the ability to uh, replace the bayonet no, and the fitting yeah. type that you, uh, there we go yeah so the the ability to you know have a wide selection of cameras to mount on the back of it that seems quite exciting for uh for cambo and, and very um open to development in the future because in theory you can develop that to any future and particularly mirrorless camera that's that's released yeah well, who knows what we will see in the future um we have uh, yeah. we've always been quite fast to react when a new system was uh, was added, uh, like the well the, the Fuji GFX, for instance, that was very important for us uh, yeah. when that was announced announced uh, at the Fotokina. We we made sure to uh, to add that bayonet the, the same day that it came to the market. Fuji, Fuji okay. was kind enough to share the drawing with us, and um, we have seen that amongst. People buying a Fuji GFX, that's yeah, um, it's become an become an important user group uh, amongst our clients. Mm. Yeah, 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 and it's um, I find that very exciting because you know there's, um, you know, with with cameras like that, you know, you don't have necessarily the same uh, uh, equipment available that allows you to tilt and shift as uh, you know that's developed from. Uh, from large format and medium format systems. So the fact that you can put a, you know, a smaller sensor camera on there, which is, you know, more limited in terms of uh, its resolution, but, you know, the ability to mount it onto a, a Cambo Actor still gives you that flexibility over uh, over your perspective and your and the control that you have over your photography. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to, quit that off and see from Steve whether there are any questions that we should look at answering uh, while we have you here. Um, I can see there are quite a few that have come through here so I'm just gonna put this one on here. So we've got one question from Robert which is there are so many variations of digital Rodenstock and Schneider lenses from about 500 pounds on eBay to many thousands from Cambo directly. To me, the lens is the most important part of what will be my actor system. What should I look out for? I hear the Cambo lenses are a mix of other manufacturers' glass. How do these companies compare to Rodenstock Digital and Digital Lenses? Good question. So that was uh, a much better way of asking the question that, uh, that I put forward at one stage, which is, yeah, what what should people be looking yeah. out for? Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question, but it's still a, a pretty hard, hard question to, to give a generic answer to. I mean... Um, what to watch out for um, depends a lot on your demands. I mean, if, if you're going to, to use this lens with a digital back, then you at least you need a lens with a good functioning sh shutter in it because without a good, good shutter, you can't work with it. But if, if, you ca if you are going to use it on a platform like this with a camera at the rear, which has a built-in focal plane shutter, you may be very happy with a lens which has a broken shutter, as long as you can use the aperture you're fine. I mean, it will still it will still work for you. So there's a large variety in prices and what you see on the internet. And I mean, I know that there's junk among it, among it. But if you buy from a reliable source and you have a chance to, to try it, then you're probably good. Mm. Yeah, I think it goes without saying, you know, having someone like ourselves who can uh, can help on that journey of, of testing various different lenses is it's, it's it's certainly useful because um, you know the actress is so open platform that there's uh, you know there's a lot to uh, a lot to take into consideration. So it's uh, it's good to uh, find some people who can you know help you on that uh, on that journey. And I think another thing to be said is you know with the legacy lenses, 
you know, if your requirement is that you want absolutely perfect resolution images, uh, then that's a very different consideration to just, you know, any lens that you could find on eBay, which might have its own charm, but might not necessarily be, you know, the utmost uh, resolution, as it were. Oh, that's true. But there are also some very cheap lenses around that are for mm. some purposes, may, may be perfect. Let's say that you're doing macro, mm. uh, you may be very happy with, uh, with a cheap and larger lens, because uh, in the, the range you're working in, uh, that lens is actually performing very good, if you have a good mm -hmm. one. They're usually, the, the coating is not, not great, because they were made for use in a dark room, so uh, flare was non-existent, so you have to make sure that you shade the lens very well. But if you if you know what you're doing and you watch out a little bit, then uh, you can get very good results uh, with it. Uh, I've seen clients working with old uh, eight eight by ten enlarged lenses, four or five enlarged lenses, and making uh, huge uh, prints uh, of let's say of flowers or things that they are shooting, and they uh, they don't want want to use anything else than these lenses that they have. Yeah, have yeah. bought for very good money. I think, yeah, yeah, I think the Actus encourages quite a lot of experimentation, which I like. You know, the ability to use anything uh, on the front uh, is, 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 I think, quite exciting. So we've got another one from Robert, which again is quite, it's, 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 it's the kind of question that we get quite a lot uh, sent through to us, which is how do crop factors work with these lenses? So it would seem that Robert's using a, a Hasselblad X1D. So for instance, if we were to take the Actar 19 millimeter lens, you know, how would that lens differ in terms of the frame it's given you, you know, whether you were putting a medium format sensor on the back or, or, or using it with a, uh, you know, a 35 millimeter mirrorless camera? Um, there's, been, there, there's no crop factor. I mean, uh, focal length is not changing. It's just, it's the field mm -hmm. of view that changes um, um, depending on the, kind, on the size of sensor that you're using. So a 90 millimeter is, let's say, an extreme wide angle when you're using a, a 24, 36 millimeter sensor, and it is even a little bit more extreme when you use the Hasselblad with X1D, which has a 32, 33 to 44 millimeter sensor. So it would be comparable like something like, let's say, a 15 millimeter on a, on a 35 millimeter camera. Hmm. So it becomes a even more super yeah, wide, it becomes a very, very super wide lens. Indeed. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what else have we got in here? So, ah, good one. Richard is interested to know whether the axis is compatible with the Leica SL2. Yeah, it is. It it's is. Just, just yeah. a matter of changing the bayonet. We, uh, we have had a Leica bayonet or an L mount, as we have to call it now, because it's also for Panasonic and, um, and Sigma. We have had that around for a couple of years now. Mm. Yeah. So again, going back to the uh, image on the uh, in the middle on the right hand side, which is the Actus G, you know, really, all you need to do is replace the physical uh, camera bayonet. And uh, in, in, in theory, you know, that's going to be future compatible with whatever cameras are released, uh, to some extent. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'd I don't know. Uh, is there any manufacturer left that still needs to introduce a mirrorless platform? But let that see. Maybe. Mm, yeah. If they do, uh, we need to add another bayonet. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got another, which would be, so a question from Martina, who's asking if using with a, let me put it on the screen. Hang on. So if using the Actus with a Sony A7R4, which I do know has some uh, limitations because of the larger battery grip, and maybe you can cover that in the answer. Mm -hmm. um, but if, 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 if someone was using that camera for architectural or interiors photography, she's asking whether what, what's the best combination of lenses. And to some extent, this relates to the question we've just answered, which would be, I suppose, looking at a wide angle lens. And I'm thinking maybe the uh, the Actar 19 could be a good one to, to take into consideration here. You know, what's... What, what's going to be a, um, uh, a good combination of lenses, you know, and, and maybe, maybe it would be Actar lenses in this instance. What, what would you think to that? Richard? Yeah, I would really like this one uh, because mm. it, it will not obstruct, uh, the hand grip will not obstruct the movements. Um, because mm. of all the, the changes that we've made to this lens, lens design, 
when you are focusing focusing it with a Nikon or with a Sony A7, you'll have a little bit more cl clearance between front and rear standards than you will have when you are using a, a Canon Canon 70 millimeter lens, which which is in its uh, original housing. So you refer to uh, to the large hand grip and how it can obstruct movements. That's actually only relevant when you're working with the, with the Canon. Uh, having okay. said that, we have recently uh, we have changed the design of the, our Canon adapter, so it's not as uh, obtrusive uh, anymore as it used to be. Uh, but still, this one is easier to live with. Hmm. And another one from Robert, who's been nice and busy in the uh, in the chat section. Can a mirrorless camera again? Uh, namely the Hasselblad X1D be used on the back of a Cambo uh, WRS camera or are there only zero flange focal distance back? So yeah, the question is basically, is it possible to adapt a, uh, a mirrorless camera to the back of the WRS? No, uh, unfortunately not. The WRS is, is really for use with digital backs. So, so there's nothing between the sensor and the, and the camera board. Hmm. And having having wondered that question myself before, what specifically is the limitation? Uh, it's still flange focal distance. So when you are looking at uh, the Hasselblad, um, when you take off the lens, you look into the camera, you see the sensor or, or the filter that's, that's in front of the sensor, and you see the, the flange, and there's still some space between the sensor and the flange. And that's that space, although it's pretty thin, with uh, when you're looking at the Hasselblad, it's still too much. Uh, when when you look at the digital back, it's just the sensor that you're looking at. There's there's nothing between the, okay. the sensor and the camera, so that is what you what you need for a design like the WRS. Okay, and there's one final question that I'm going to take from Ender, which is another good one for any GFX users out there which is, are the shift movements on the GFX still quite limited on the Actor system? So again, maybe this is <laughs> taking into context the Actar 19 millimeter. Are there, I suppose that's meant to be, is there a lens to overcome this in the future? So I suppose this again, uh, knowing that Ender's an architectural photographer, you know, would the Actar 19 millimeter open up possibilities to people using the GFX 100 sensor in wanting lots of movement? Uh, for wide angle photography? I'd say yes, but uh, compared to what? Mm. Uh, mm. Because you refer to yeah. uh, to uh, movements being limited, but that was using what kind of lens? That's a good point. Um, I suppose maybe what would have otherwise been the wide angle options, which might have been the Canon tilt shift lenses or um, or I suppose the Actar 24 millimeter, which would have been another wide angle offering. You know, is the and I, I think we've answered it already, but does the 19 millimeter really open up that gap that was there in terms of a workable wide angle lens? Yeah, from personal experience, I would say that uh, when you pair the 19 millimeter with a Fuji GFX, uh, you have a usable uh, eight millimeter of shift in every direction. Uh, you can shift more, you won't have a hard vignetting, but at some point uh, the quality deter deteriorates. So, but at eight millimeters, you won't have any loss of, of quality. It will be will, will be still good. And mm -hmm. knowing the let's say the the Rolstar Digitron 23 lens, which is a very well uh, well respected, very high quality wide angle lens, um, and I've tried the 23 and the 90 millimeter both on a phase one sensor. Uh, the 90 millimeter actor uh, has a little bit more shift than the rover stock, so that's actually mm. pretty pretty good for for such a wide angle lens. Mm. And what we've also yeah. experienced yeah. is that uh, what Nikon has done very well is the coating on this lens. So it's very hard it's very hard to use a compendium on a, on a wide angle like this because with any camera movement that you make, you're actually shooting your own compendium. So in most circumstances, you, you need to work without. And this lens is, is really great when you're shooting straight into the sun. It's, uh, it has very little flare. So that's something that they have really done right. Uh, yeah, let's say uh, kudos you, to my you, 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 you picked a yeah, good lens. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I know it's not cheap, that's it's good. an expensive lens, but uh, 
Yeah. And there's a reason for it. It's 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 really good. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Well, um, I think that covers all of the the questions that I can see that have been flagged in the uh, in the chat section. But um, I think it's safe to say, you know, you're always uh, extremely uh, helpful whenever we've got questions to fire over. So if there's anything that follows on from this uh, that people want to find out, then um, then we'll be sure to um, to you know give people all the information. Um, and uh, but yeah, otherwise I, I really appreciate you taking the time, Richard. It's been uh, it's been good to. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It was nice. Mm. Yeah, I think um, it's good. There's a there's a lot to unpack with Cambo, and it's been uh, yeah, it's been really great of you to take the time and uh, and go through it with us. Right. Okay. Yeah, and um, we uh, we wish you a good end to the year, and uh, and hopefully uh, twenty twenty one will allow us um, to catch up proper, uh, catch up proper next year. Yeah, hopefully uh, it will be a better year. We'll be in touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. Well, um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I'm just going to switch your camera off, Richard. Richard, thank you so much. Yeah. Really good to see Bye. you. Bye. Yeah. All right. Take care. And. Um, Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I'm just going to put up our contact detail here. If anyone's got any follow on questions um, that haven't been covered, or if you've got any interest at all that we can help with, um, you know, you can, uh, you can contact us uh, via the email uh, in the middle of the screen there. And then also um, you can, you know, there's various amounts of information on our website about the Cambo system, but if you do have any uh, specific questions, you know, by all means get in touch. And um, other than that, Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and uh, yeah, we hope to see you soon. Take care.